Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now if you had less than £500 to spend on a PC back in 2011, you might have ended up with one of these. This is the Acer Predator G5900 and compared to its predecessors, it would have been a little bit underwhelming. It certainly would have drawn me in with its black and orange styling, that's for sure, because it still worked on me. I found this one on eBay and it was listed as untested with the full specifications remaining a mystery until I powered it on. Before we talk about that though, let's go more in depth regarding what this one has inside and why I think it would have been a bit meh at the start of the last decade. Opening it up and my eyes are drawn straight to the large plastic fan cone designed to help draw air in through the side vents, I guess. We don't really see these with pre-builts anymore. My personal inclination would be to remove it and add a rear fan to the case. Like everything else, it has a light coating of dust on it. This can be cleaned with a gentle wipe from a cloth. No special liquids or sprays are needed yet. The included 4GB of RAM would have been fine too, this was the amount commonly suggested in a lot of similarly priced custom build guides, or found inside other pre-builts of this value. So far so good, but let's move on to the rest of the specs, after a quick word on the condition of the PC these days. It looks like this machine has been dropped in a puddle of water, or perhaps a large volume of liquid has been dropped next to it, and splashed all up the side and through the holes in the panel. I say this because we have what looks like watermarks in here as well, as all over the back of the graphics card, which we'll remove now. Aside from what looks like dried patches of liquid on the back, there's a little bit of rust or corrosion around this area of the case too. It's not the worst condition decade old machine I've ever seen, far from it. We touched on the subject of the graphics card just now, so let's expand on that. I found a couple of old reviews of this machine, but they both mentioned an NVIDIA GT 440, which even back then was referred to, and I quote from an expert reviews write up, drastically underpowered for a PC that's targeted at gamers. We haven't got a GT440 though, no, we've got a GT340, so I'm assuming this computer would have cost less than the £480 price tag I've seen mentioned elsewhere. The GT340 has 1GB of GDDR5 memory and according to GPUZ launched in late 2009. I don't think this meant that the Predator G5900 was necessarily bad value for money in terms of pre-built because I don't know how it stacked up in comparison to other PCs on offer. It's just that if you were buying this for gaming back then, it probably wasn't the best idea. It would have sat in an abyss between overpowered office PC and underpowered gaming rig. I get the impression the performance didn't match the rather bold styling. You have to remember as well that DirectX 11 capable cards were starting to become more and more prevalent, and it probably wouldn't have been long before the owner of this would have felt the need to upgrade this old DX10.1 card, or just put the whole system in a dusty cupboard and forget all about it. The CPU fell into the it's okay but a bit outdated bracket as well. The listing said this one had a first gen core i5 and I was hoping that maybe we had a quad core i5 750 in here. Turns out, and I pretty much expected this, we actually had an i5 650, a two core chip with hyper threading. Now this was okay back in 2010 for sure, but by 2011 the emergence of quad core Sandy Bridge i5s ushered in what I like to call a golden age of PC gaming. Socket 1155 brought with it some of Intel's best and most popular processors, and up until a few years ago, a lot of your favourite tech channels, myself included, were still recommending them. I reckon you could still get by with an i7-2600K for gaming, by the way. Again, for the cost of this system, maybe the i5-650 was actually a solid offering for the price you were paying, but even if it was, I think this processor in combination with the GT340 graphics card was too little, too late sort of thing. You know how like when a new product releases and it's good, but 
there are already other better options available and paying a little bit more would go a long way. That said, there was and still is room for upgrade. A first gen i7 RAM upgrade and a low cost 10 series graphics card would transform this thing from sluggish old pensioner into, well, slightly younger pensioner who can still run the odd marathon. The 450 watt 80 plus bronze PSU will allow for this too, by the way. Acer also used standard sized parts here too, none of that proprietary nonsense, so you could swap the board out as well if you wanted to and build a sleeper machine inside what is still a great looking enclosure. If your G5900 is dusty and a little dirty like mine, rest assured this whole thing can be taken apart and stripped down pretty easily. And after spending a couple of hours cleaning it up and scraping off a few rust patches with wire wool, it was good as new. Sort of. Despite the specs, I actually really like the case design. I like the little plastic flaps that open when you eject the DVD drive, and I like the easily accessible and hot swappable hard drive bays at the front. This is definitely the sort of computer 17 year old me would have wanted had I have seen one back in 2011. It probably drew quite a few people in with its good looks and then disappointed them with the performance. The best part is that it still works, or at least it did. More on that later on. Weirdly, it wouldn't boot with the GT340 in the system, so I had to swap that out for a GT710 temporarily just to get into the BIOS. After I filmed the initial boot up, I went away for the weekend, and when I came back, the PC wouldn't actually turn on at all. I have no idea why, because nothing changed, so it's back to the diagnostic bench for a while. Oddly enough, the graphics card did decide to start working, albeit in a different machine. And because of this, I decided to test a few games that date back to around the time this card would have been fairly new, just to give you a rough idea of performance. We are using a much more powerful CPU than anything that was available back then, as well as 16 gigs of DDR4 RAM. Still, this will allow the card to reach its maximum potential and demonstrate what the GT340 would have been like in action. Surprising is the word I want to start with. 2011 Skyrim ran at 1080p low with around 50 FPS. This increased to 60 under calmer circumstances. This is already better than I thought, but remember we are using a modern 8 core CPU and 16 gigs of RAM. The card is doing its best though, and perhaps I was too quick to judge earlier. Skyrim isn't exactly notoriously demanding though, but let's move on. Call of Duty Black Ops released in 2010 and remains one of my favorite COD games in the series, probably thanks to Nuketown alone. Once again, the GT340 delivered playable frame rates, and once again, it did a better job than I was anticipating. I expected much, much worse. Mafia 2, the original that is, was one of 2010's more demanding titles, and for a 60fps experience, 720p is best. The game is still playable at 900 and 1080p, but 720p gives us the best results. I've gone with the low visual settings too, which honestly don't look much worse than the medium or high settings, so bear that in mind. LA Noire is perhaps one of my favourite games from the 2010s too, and because of the facial motion capture technology, it is capped at 30fps during gameplay by default. The GT340 could handle this just about, but there were some significant drops here and there, and this is where the card struggled most. As 2011 passed and we moved into 2012, this card would have been a lot more hit and miss in games, and the i5-650 would have started to feel the pressure too. That said, credit where it is due because I didn't even expect this level of performance from it. While we're on the subject of the best games of the 2010s, let's talk about Battlefield Bad Company 2. This blew me away when it first came out, even though I played it on console at the time of its release. We can actually retain a 60fps average here by choosing the lowest settings at 1080p, and I certainly expected to have to make more of a resolution sacrifice here. I'm going to fast forward here a few years and show you some GTA 5 footage, a much later game that still supports older DirectX versions. It's running in 10.1 mode even though RTSS says DX11. At 720p we were just about able to squeeze 30 frames per second from it, giving us a PS3 and 360 console equivalent experience. The Predator might be dead, but the water damaged, rust ridden GT340 lives on for now. Don't get me wrong, my opinion of the Predator G5900 was that it was a little lacking spec wise when it first came out, but it didn't cost a fortune and probably would have made for a fairly solid system for a good couple of years. 
It certainly has upgrade potential even today, providing we can resuscitate it, though the two core first gen i5 it shipped with meant it was more mediocre out of the box than it could have been had it featured something from the Sandy Bridge lineup. That would have shifted it into an entirely new price bracket though. We will be doing something else with this, not least trying to bring it back from death. I'm hoping the motherboard hasn't decided to fry itself so that we can consider an i7 or quad-core Xeon upgrade. The possibilities are by no means endless, but there are some possibilities. And hopefully you can join me in whatever video it is that we decide to start upgrading this thing. Thank you very much for watching then. If you enjoyed this one, leave a like on it. Leave a dislike if you didn't. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and hopefully I'll see all of you in the next one.